Welcome to CivilNet. This is your host, Eric Kokian, and today is my honor and pleasure to have as our guest a man whose name has gone around the world the last couple of days because of his uh, very critical report that he did on the situation in the Gornabarabal Fash Artsakh. And Mr. Acampo, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I want to, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of briefly, obviously, your uh, your write-up is exceptionally detailed. Can you give us a two-minute version of what you wrote uh, for average people that don't uh, haven't read your report? What is what are the primary points in what you uh, have laid out? No, basically, the, there is a re autonomous region in the territory of today Syria called Nagorno Karabakh, who is which is inhabited by hundreds of thousands of Armenians. And therefore, at the end of the last war in 2020 between Armenia and Azerbaijan, there was established that these people were protected by peacekeepers, Russian peacekeepers, and would be connected through a corridor going to call Lachin Corridor, connecting Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. So that would be the way that hundreds of thousand Armenians will stay alive, protected by Russians and connected with Armenia. So in December 22, uh, Azerbaijan was blocking this corridor and sealed off in June. So since June, since June there's no more uh, food, gasoline arriving to Nagorno Karabakh, and the winter is coming. Uh, that are the facts. The facts are well known. What I did as an expert is say, okay, but these facts means something. It's not just a humanitarian crisis. It's not just a political crisis. It's a genocide. It's a genocide. That is my contribution. My contribution is obvious. I say, look, these facts are the archetype of genocide, particular, the, the particular of genocide is Article 2C, at deliberately inflicting on the group condition of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. That is one definition of genocide, Article 2C. So, and that's the point. People believe genocide require require massive number of killings. Millions of Jews were exterminated by the Nazis. Gas chamber. Okay, that's one way to commit genocide. Rwanda was a different way. Starvation, in fact, was the main reason that of the extermination of the Armenians in 1915. In 1915, the Armenians were exterminated, forced, displaced, and they were dying for starvation. And it's incredible that 107 years later, 108 years later, something similar happened. Because basically the blockade of the food is creating the conditions to destroy physically the Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh. The, the blockade of the, of the corridor transformed Nagorno-Karabakh in a concentration camp. That's it. And, well, and that, so that is in short, that's why it's a genocide. Well, uh, I mean, it's a very good explanation, uh, very clear. Uh, one thing that, again, as I think I was going to ask the second question, actually, but you brought it up. I think I was struck uh, by your line about hunger. Because as you said, there are no crematoriums, there's no machete attacks. Starvation is the invisible Yeah. Genocide weapon, and it's and as you said, it's quite ironic that essentially the same format is being repeated by, frankly, by extension, many of the same people for the same ends, and that is the weaponization of hunger. Because as you said, people think of genocide as necessarily direct violence, which it almost leads to, but there are different forms, and this is no less than that. So the second and uh, question, which is the logical one, is if there is. Uh, genocide being perpetrated in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Artsakh, 
what are the legal ramifications and more importantly, what are the legal responsibilities both internationally and domestically? As we know, in 1994, the Clinton administration was quite reluctant to call the Rwandan genocide genocide because they would have forced them to act. So can you explain a little bit about what this, the fact that there's a genocide being attempted in Artsakh, what does this trigger internationally? It's not attempted, let me be clear. It's ex- implemented because this particular crime to see does not require the physical extermination. It just requires creating the conditions to produce the consequences. So, and the conditions are created when they block the corridor. It's still, yes, these people are still alive. And that is the next the, the next topic. And the, the, genocide, the genocide convention requires state parties, including US, Russia, European Union members, to prevent and to punish. So the but should be investigation and, and criminal investigation, but the priority here is to prevent. Because these people, 120,000 Armenians are still alive. The genocide is already happening, but they are still alive. Because the genocide does not require the today physical extermination. The condition to produce extermination is the crime itself. That's why even genocide is occurring, now we need to prevent the death of these people. And that is a total priority. Okay. Uh, let me move on to another, it's, it's a bit of an, uh, it's, a, it's not a complete thread off of what we were saying, but I want to see what, there's obviously analogies. Uh, every genocide, every case of genocide is, is unique in its own way, but it's also analogous to other things. What you're seeing today, what is this analogous to? Is this the uh, is this Srebrenica? Is this the siege of Sarajevo? Is this the Warsaw Ghetto? Historically, in the context of law and and what's genocide, happening, what, what are we looking at? Starvation was used against Armenians in 1915, but then there were also killings, specific killings. So normally, genocide combined different different weapons. Starvation was used against the Jews and police in 1939. Starvation was used against the Russians in Leningrad. Starvation was using, used against in Cambodia. You know, starvation is, is, is not, is one of the tools and with other tools. It's ironic that 1915, starvation was one of the main weapons to destroy the Armenians and now is repeated. The cycle is, is closing. The issue is there are many genocides. The problem is this is a genocide that could be stopped. And that importance of using the name of genocide, because if you call this a political problem, okay, you unblock the corridor and it's solved it. No. If you call this humanitarian crisis, okay, you give food and it's solved it. No, it's a genocide. It's a genocide, and then should be that it's causing death and should be prevented and influence how this problem of these Armenians living in a country led by a person who is trying to commit a genocide against them. So that's why the, the label of genocide is so important. It's not you, we have to really understand is not calling humanitarian crisis, calling it political crisis, is reducing the problem. Yeah, I think well, what your what your document has done is to raise it to not only moral level but also a legal level or far more yeah. relevant. Uh, one of the things that the logical question is: uh, uh, you have this this report. You clearly outlined the case that this is an attempted genocide. Frankly, no one has made a compelling case against the case that you made. Uh, what are the next steps internationally? Is this something that needs to go to the United Nations Security Council? Or when, how, what is the ICC rule here? What are the next logical steps? No, no. But the, the, yes, the obligation of the states is prevent and punish. But prevent is a priority. So now I believe it's very important 
to talk to U.S. In the U.S., the key actor is Secretary of State Blinken because he is personally running the negotiation between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, but also he is the person in the U.S. government who can decide if this is a genocide. That's why Secretary Blinken is very important. And in, interestingly, he is highly committed to prevent genocide. His family suffered. His family were also victims, and also some of his family were ambassadors trying to control the genocide in the Nazi time. So that's why he is really a person who understands the problem. And you have Samantha Power in the administration. Samantha Power wrote the best book on this topic, The Problem from Hell, explaining very carefully why during those genocides, in, in particular Armenia and Nazis and Cambodia, the, the American politicians refused to intervene. What are the restrictions they have? So we have in the administration of President Biden, people who understand very, very well the problem. And President Biden himself was the first U.S. president that recognized 1915 was a genocide against Armenian people. So the administration now has to take decisions to avoid to be accomplice of a genocide. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we talked about, obviously, in your uh, in your uh, memo, you clearly outlined who the who the responsible. There's one responsible party. Obviously, we're dealing with a very vicious authoritarian system. Yeah, in in uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, but as you know, even if there's one person who's in charge, uh, there are many many others who enable this. I mean, you can look at the Hik the, the Hikmet Hajeev and his statements. He actually threatened. Uh, he actually demanded an ethnic cleansing of Armenians and Artsakh by his famous. Actually, on Twitter, he must be the first person to try to commit genocide on Twitter by saying the game is over. I leave these territories. Uh, if uh, legal action is ever taken, if it ever comes to it against uh, Ilhan Aliyev uh, as someone who is, is is carrying out a genocide, what are the legal implications for all the henchmen around him and everyone who's enabling him in his regime? To, to convict for genocide, you need to prove the intention to exterminate the people. And I think you can de deduce the intention from the President Aliyev decisions. He knowingly, willingly, voluntarily block the, 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 the corridor, creating the conditions to exterminate the Armenians. The other people, we don't know right now if they have intention of genocide. I mentioned few of them involved in the chain of command, but at least they should be investigated for crimes against humanity. That's clear. So, but again, for me, the priority is not to punish, the priority is to prevent. That's why it's not so much about the judges, it's not so much about sending the case to the court. First, prevent the crimes. That's our priority. Very good. I'm going to close with a sort of a, a question that sort of marries, kind of marry politics with human rights law, because normally there's some level of distinction there. One of the things that is discussed in diplomatic, all these negotiations, and everyone talks about it, is the rights and securities of the Armenians of Artsakh, i.e. there's a way in which uh, you can recognize uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azeri territory, which is legally not a slam dunk. It's actually somewhat dubious historically, but let's just take it for what it is. Uh, the fallback is that uh, it's very clear that there needs to be international uh, protection uh, and protection for the rights and securities of the Armenians of Artsakh. In reality, however, uh, is in, if, if there's a regime like the one in Baku that is trying to commit genocide, in what context can that regime ever be trusted to even negotiate within rights and securities when it does the fact that it is trying to commit genocide essentially uh, politically, morally, and legally trigger uh, remedial secession or uh, the, the right, the, the responsibility to protect, 
But regardless of what you think of the status of this region, these people, because they're under threat of genocide, can never be ruled by this current regime in Baku because they have attempted to essentially exterminate them. Well, legally it's complex because uh, Artsakh government has no recognition as independent country and therefore what status should be discussed right now is a part of Azerbaijan, as you rightly say. Cannot be normal citizen in a state that is committing a genocide against them. So that's why that's something the states can negotiate, they should negotiate how to protect the Armenians in Azerbaijan, because uh, if they are not protected, if they are removed, that's a genocide, another genocide. So that is for me the problem. The problem is this has no, we are now used to have a, an app, we click and we solve the problem. We get eat, we get food, a taxi, whatever. We have not an anti-genocide app clicking and getting the solution, no. But what is happening is interesting because the people like you, Eric Israelian, and other, other Armenian leaders are clicking, making this point. And Kim Kardashian click and make a different point. And there are people in Los Angeles crossing a freeway and blocking a freeway, clicking. And the media, Washington Post and Associated Press are now click, 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 presenting the problem. And now we have senators demanding answers. And the final click is basically in the hands of Secretary State Blinken. And President Putin and President Macron. They had to decide what to do. Because whatever solution is reached should respect the Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh. They could, they could not be victims of genocide, they could be protected. That's it. Well, uh, it hasn't been an easy conversation, Mr. Campo, but it's been a very enlightening one. I wanted to thank you for your time, and more, more importantly, thank you for your work and dedication, not only in this not only in this case, frankly, because you dedicated your life to this across the world, starting with your own country in Argentina that went its own through its own horrible period in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. So thank you very much for joining us. Look, let me say something. It's a, it's a singer called Kanan from Somalia. He, sung, he was singing in the South Africa World Cup 2010. He told me something, teach me something. He said to me, in Somalia, when someone asks you a favor, is giving you a big honor. So the Armenians coming to me asking my report gave me a big honor. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.